Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Fishman. I'm a counterterrorism research fellow here at the New America Foundation. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time out to, to be here today. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce David Gartenstein Ross uh, to talk about his, his new book, uh, Bin Laden's Troubled Legacy, uh, which has the sort of provocative subtitle of, of why Al Qaeda is, is winning the war on terror. Um, and I just want to, uh, I really want to thank, before David starts, I want to thank him for making a provocative argument, because I think too often we don't have uh, provocative arguments made in sort of reasonable terms. Um, and especially when we're talking about something like Al Qaeda, which gets so much attention, you see a lot of the same arguments recycled over and over and over again. And it's very, very useful, I think, to have somebody making an argument that I think is trying to poke the rest of us and, and force us to look at things in a new and different way. So with that, I'll get out of the way. Um, David will talk for 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, do Q&A. Thanks, David. Thanks, Brian. So I guess I'll get up there. Yeah, so sure, please. So I can look at everybody more easily. Then I'll sit down when I'm done. Hopefully this mic isn't on also. <laughs> All right, we'll see if this causes problems. All right, two Nokia phones, $150 each. Two HP printers, $300 each. Plus shipping, transportation, and other miscellaneous expenses adds up to a total bill of $4,200. That is all that Operation Hemorrhage co co cost us. On the other hand, the supposedly foiled plot, as some of our enemies would like to call it, will without a doubt cost America and other Western countries billions of dollars in new security measures. Thus began the lead article in a special issue of Inspire, the possibly now defunct English language online magazine of the jihadi group Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it was published in November of 2010. The publication's cover featured a photo of a UPS plane and the striking headline, $4,200, which was an unmistakable reference to a recent plot that ACAP had attempted to carry out uh, using printer cartridges uh, with bombs hidden in them. Uh, this was a clear statement of where Al Qaeda's strategy was at the time, the statement $4,200, a strategy that has more merit than many Westerners would like to admit. Uh, today I'm going to outline something that my book discusses at length, which is the evolution of Al Qaeda's economic strategy and how it reached its current state. Uh, one thing I've learned from my early discussions about the book is that people want answers as to what we do now. Um, as is the case with my book, uh, much of this speech will be backward looking rather than forward looking. Uh, I do provide some solutions as to what the way ahead is, um, but rather I, I do think that history matters. Uh, without a proper appreciation of the past, and in particular, without a, a proper appreciation of the very recent past, the past 10 years, it's going to be far more difficult to forge a better way ahead. Um, if we don't even understand the past decade, how can we get our next steps right? Uh, so the question is, what have we done before, and what does this mean for future changes to our approach? Uh, so let's rewind 10 years to just before the September 11th attacks. Before Al-Qaeda launched those devastating attacks, few within government paid any attention to, the, to it, and that despite the fact that by the end of 2000, Al Qaeda had executed two dramatic strikes against American targets. Osama bin Laden, who was Al Qaeda's late leader, was born in the late 1950s and traveled to Pakistan in the 1980s, soon after the Afghan Soviet War began. Once he arrived, bin Laden became a major financier of the Mujahideen, providing cash to relatives of wounded or martyred fighters, building hospitals, and helping Afghan refugees. But it was his first trip to the front lines in Afghanistan in 1984 that left a lasting impression. And ultimately, bin Laden uh, established a base for Arab fighters in eastern Afghanistan in 1986. Now, after losing that war, Russia didn't just withdraw from Afghanistan in defeat. Uh, the Soviet empire itself collapsed soon thereafter. And bin Laden thought that he had not just helped to drive a superpower out of Afghanistan, but that he had also helped to hasten the Soviet Union's collapse. Um, now, if one takes this as a given, um, this reveals one aspect of early Al Qaeda strategy, which is the centrality of economics to fighting against a superpower rival. After all, it's indisputable that the Soviet Union didn't collapse simply because it left Afghanistan. Rather, if one is going to draw a connection between the Soviet withdrawal and later Soviet collapse, the only way this can be done is through economics, through the argument that the costs imposed by the Afghan-Soviet war made it impossible for the Soviet Union to adapt to other challenges that it faced economically, including a grain shortage that gripped the country, and including the massively diminished worldwide price of oil 
due to a ramp up in Saudi production. The Soviet Union was very dependent upon its own oil exports. Uh, the fact that bin Laden did see his fight against the superpower as economic is something that is evident in his later rhetoric. He has on multiple occasions compared the United States to the Soviet Union, and when he has done so, his comparison has been explicitly economic in nature. Another aspect of uh, bin Laden's fight in Afghanistan that carried over into early al-Qaeda strategy was the very broadness of the fight against the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet invasion outraged the Muslim world and the Arab world. And you had condemnations coming from heads of state, from the clerical class, from the media, from the man on the street. This is why you got so many volunteers, Arab vo volunteers, flocking to South Asia to help the Afghan cause. It was a testament to the outrage that this invasion caused. Uh, these Arab volunteers included humanitarian aid workers, cooks, drivers, accountants, teachers, doctors, engineers, religious preachers, and also a contingent of foreign fighters. It also included uh, a donor network known as the Golden Chain, whose financiers came primarily from Saudi Arabia and also from other Gulf Arab states. So essentially, when one looks at this, uh, bin Laden, during the Afghan-Soviet War, sat at the top of a major uh, organization that spanned multiple countries. It included a humanitarian wing, a military wing, as well as a donor base. There was lessons to be drawn from the breadth of the fight against the Soviet Union, lessons that would also carry over into the fight against the United States. So the first problem we encounter right after the 9-11 attacks, and this is a tremendous problem, is that we never fully comprehended al-Qaeda's strategy at an official level. Um, to comprehend what I would describe as Al -Qaeda's or the U.S.'s uh, shallow understanding of al-Qaeda, uh, one need look no further than official documents uh, outlining uh, U.S. thinking in the conflict. For example, the National Military Strategic Plan for the War on Terrorism, NMSP, WOT, of course it's acronymized, uh, which was published by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, outlines America's ends, ways, and means in this conflict. Um, and ends, ways, and means are so basic to military strategy. That is, what are, is the end state that an opponent is pursuing, and what are the ways and means through which the opponent seeks to bring about this end state? So the NMSPWOT outlines America's ends, ways, and means, but never performs the same analysis for al-Qaeda, uh, which is a glaring omission. The impression one gets is that al-Qaeda does not have an overarching plan. This is an impression one gets from multiple other bodies within government. The White House's National Strategy for Combating Terrorism does somewhat more to explain the goal of America's jihadi foes, talking about their desire to reestablish the caliphate, um, their desire to expel Western power and influence from the Muslim world, in their words, and establish regimes that rule according to a violent and intolerant distortion of Islam. But this National Strategy for Combating Terrorism also doesn't assess how they intend to get there. It's likewise with the 9-11 Commission Report, it talks about Bin Laden's desire to reestablish the caliphate, it, it talks about the tactic of terrorism, it doesn't connect the two, as though there is an unresolved disconnect between the goal that this adversary seeks to achieve and the tactic that it employs in getting there. So we were wrong about this. You know, Al-Qaeda has, in fact, proven to be both a determined and also a skillful adversary. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, is to outline the evolution of Al-Qaeda's strategy over the past decade. Uh, we start with terrorist attacks in the economy. Bin Laden's perception of the 9-11 attacks was elucidated at length in October 2001 in an interview he gave with an Al Jazeera journalist named Taseer Aluni. It's significant contemporaneous evidence of what Bin Laden intended through these attacks. The very first thing he talks about that he believes Al-Qaeda accomplished through these attacks was economic. According to their own admissions, he said, referring to the Americans, the share of losses on the Wall Street market reached 16%. They say this number is a record. Then he continued providing an exposition of the actual economic costs that this entailed, as well as associated costs, which showed that he'd given a great deal of thought to the economic damage that he had uh, inflicted upon American society. The gross amount that is traded on that market reaches $4 trillion, he said. So if we multiply 16% by $4 trillion to find out the loss that affected the stocks, it reaches $640 billion of losses from stocks. But he knew that direct damage wasn't the extent of the damage. Um, he also talked about lost productivity, uh, building and construction losses. Essentially, he was speaking the economic language of the Wall Street jur Journal in describing what he thought the 9-11 attacks had wrought upon the United States. Uh, in a video that bin Laden released in October 2004, just before the U.S. elections that year, he amplified this analysis by pointing out how much damage 9-11 inflicted on the United States in comparison to the much smaller costs for al-Qaeda. Uh, 
Al-Qaeda, he said, spent $500,000 on the event, while America, in the incident and its aftermath, lost, by the lowest estimate, more than $500 billion, meaning that every dollar of Al-Qaeda defeated a million dollars. This statement by bin Laden typifies what asymmetric warfare strategy is. Every one of our dollars defeated a million of their dollars, he said. Some of the US's reactions after the 9-11 attacks in establishing its counterterrorism apparatus and strategy have helped to further drive up the costs of possible terrorist attacks, uh, including the inefficiency of our system of homeland defense. Uh, as I'll discuss, Al-Qaeda's strategy would later come to rely upon exploiting this inefficiency. So a second facet of Al-Qaeda's economic strategy for combating the US has been to embroil it in bleeding wars overseas. Bin Laden also explicitly referred to this. Uh, the US had uh, a clear interest in taking military action in Afghanistan following 9-11 to deprive Al-Qaeda of its sanctuary there. But exploration of further military actions against Iraq also began almost immediately. In November 2001, the Pentagon began formal consideration of plans to attack Iraq. Now, if one has a proper understanding of Al-Qaeda's strategy and the two prongs of the strategy that I outlined, uh, economically undermine the US and also make the war with the US as broad as possible, it was entirely conceivable that the Iraq war could end up furthering both of these prongs of Al-Qaeda's strategy. And I would argue that that's exactly uh, what it did. Uh, the Iraq war was, of course, a very, of course, a very costly war, uh, costing more than a trillion dollars in direct budgetary outlays, and much more when you account for second order economic consequences. Uh, but in addition, uh, the Iraq invasion helped the other major element of Al-Qaeda's strategy by feeding the overarching narrative that Islam itself was under attack, and in fact, drawing a number of people from neighboring states into the Iraq theater to fight against the United States. Uh, long before the financial crisis hit, bin Laden recognized that the invasion of Iraq played into his strategy of economic warfare. He spoke of this in the major address I just referred to that Al Jazeera broadcast in October of 2004. Um, the overarching theme of that address was economic, and he talked about how Al Qaeda was succeeding in its strategy of bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. Uh, he said that it was easy to bait the United States, that Al-Qaeda only needed to send two Mujahideen to the furthest point east to raise a piece of cloth on which is written Al-Qaeda in order to make the generals race there to cause America to suffer human, economic, and political losses. And in a September 2007 video message, bin Laden explicitly compared the US to the Soviet Union. He claimed that thinkers who study events and happenings were now predicting the American empire's collapse, comparing President Bush to Leonid Brezhnev, who was the architect of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, he said, the mistakes of Brezhnev are now being repeated by Bush. This strategy of economic warfare would go through other phases. Uh, one of them was focusing attacks on a key economic vulnerability, that is, the US's dependence upon imported oil. There have been several attempts at the oil supply in Saudi Arabia. But the dramatic collapse of the American economy in September 2008 ushered in a new phase in Al-Qaeda's strategy for fighting the US. This collapse made America seem mortal. Uh, it's a perception that is apparent throughout the ranks of jihadi spokesmen, as well as the rank and file. Uh, for example, the late Yemeni-American cleric Anwar al-Awlaki said, due to this jihad, the US economy is reeling today. America cannot withstand this Islamic nation. It is too weak. America's cunning is weaker than, than a spider web. Online jihadi commentators also refer frequently to the diminished US economy and to America's perceived mortality. Uh, this perception of imminent victory has produced adaptations to Al Qaeda's strategy. The new phase has been described in Inspire as the strategy of a thousand cuts. Inspire lucidly explains that large strikes such as those of 9 11 are, in its view, no longer required to defeat the United States, but rather, it says, to bring down America, we do not need to strike big. In such an environment of security phobia that is sweeping America, it is more feasible to stage smaller attacks that involve less players and less time to launch, and thus we may circumvent the security barriers America worked so hard to erect. Uh, these attacks don't even need to be carried out by individuals who are recognizable members of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, the organization, is attempting to harness something that is so important and so prominent in our public discourse, that is, Al-Qaeda the idea. Um, Al-Qaeda encourages self-motivated supporters to focus on targets that will advance the organization's strategy of warfare. One great example is a two-hour video released in June 2011, which urged Muslims to buy guns and attack targets of opportunity in the United States. The video emphasized economic targets, 
displaying the logos of Exxon, Merrill Lynch, and Bank of America. Indeed, rank-and-file jihadis and their online supporters seem to have internalized the importance of striking economic targets based on a review of their online discussions. Uh, in this new strategy of a thousand cuts, whether attacks succeed in killing al-Qaeda's enemies may be beside the point. If an attack breaches the enemy's security, it will significantly drive up costs, even if it kills nobody and cause no, causes no structural damage. As Alaki noted in Inspire, blowing up cargo planes in the ink cartridge plot would have made us very pleased, but according to our plan and specified objectives, it was only a plus. The attack, in his view, could be considered a success even without killing anybody. Other jihadi statements also reflect an awareness that even failed attacks can, ex can succeed in their objectives ex explicitly by driving up costs. Security is expensive, and these costs can grind down Western economies. One analogy that I use frequently um, in describing my overall argument um, is actually something that came from uh, a political science journal, uh, International Security, published just about three months before the 9-11 attacks in September of 2001, uh, an article entitled How the Weak Win Wars. And it began with an extended look at the famed Rumble in the Jungle boxing match that Muhammad Ali and George Foreman fought in Zaire in October of 1974. Um, George Foreman had been heavily favored in that fight. He was the strongest, most powerful boxer of his generation. Uh, Muhammad Ali was definitely the underdog. Uh, in the match, uh, rather than going to the center of the ring, Muhammad Ali retreated uh, and leaned against the ropes and um, sometimes whispered horse taunts at George Foreman, who lost his temper, and his blows became a blur as he hit Muhammad Ali again and again. What Foreman didn't realize, and what the spectators didn't realize, is that the elastic ring ropes were actually absorbing the majority of the blows. Essentially, George Foreman's strength was turned into a weapon against him. As the harder he hit, the more tired he became. He was visibly exhausted by the fifth round, and by the eighth round, Muhammad Ali knocked him out, pulling, up a, pulling off a stunning upset. Um, in How the Weak Win Wars, the argument that that article advances is that this is exactly how a relatively small weak power, like Al-Qaeda or another non-state actor, can defeat a superpower like the United States by turning its very strength into, its, into a weapon against it. Um, one can see how well Al-Qaeda has, in fact, over the past decade, incorporated similar lessons. Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are well aware of the costs guarant that guaranteeing security from the threat of terrorism uh, impose upon America and impose upon our national debt. A key step in moving forward is to recognize how jihadi militants are replicating Muhammad Ali's rope-a-dope strategy for defeating George Foreman. In the jihadi's view, as the United States more, spends more and more to defend itself against terrorism, it makes itself weaker and easier to knock out, rather than making itself stronger. Okay. Let's switch. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, I guess I'm going to ask a few questions, and then, and then we'll do Q&A. You raise really s critical and central issues here about what Al Qaeda's strategy is, and I and I tend to agree with you that there has been far too little discussion of of how Al Qaeda intends to get there from here, yeah. um, especially in the United States. And one of the things I want to come back to a little bit later is why don't we have a more mature discussion in Washington about these sorts of things? But but I do think it's, it's worth sort of uh, interrogating a little bit this, this notion that Al-Qaeda is so strategic and far-seen and is able to develop these strategies. I mean, bin Laden laid out this economic approach in October of 2001, not in August. Um, it was after the attack, even if it was around the same time period. That said, there are other documents. I, I yep. was reminded as you were talking of, of, of Abu Bakr Naji's The Management of Savagery, which lays out a, a very sort of similar sort of right. framework and of, of uh, sort of economic uh, ex exhaustion. Um, so my question is, you know, how can we be certain? And are, are we giving Al Qaeda too much credit for strategic foresight? And how do we differentiate their, their propaganda from actual strategic framing? Because that's, that's one of the, the hardest challenges for any of us doing research on these questions. I, I think some people do give them too much credit. I, I think my, my book doesn't, I'll explain it in a second, yeah. but you know, one example of giving them too much credit, I think, 
um, is Bruce Rydell's book um, on the search for Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, I don't dislike Rydell as, a, as an analyst at all. Um, this is not against Rydell, but I disagree with him on a point that he makes in the book where he says that one of the purposes of the 9-11 attacks was to draw the United States into both Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. I don't think bin Laden had the foresight that the U.S. would ultimately enter Iraq. I mean, I, I have not seen um, the, any evidence suggesting that he had that in mind. But to me, strategy is not so much having a strategy map, especially when you're a small non-state actor mm -hmm. who does not get to drive strategy the way the U.S. does get to have a broader plan. Um, strategy isn't, you know, you have a master plan mapped out and things proceed exactly as you want. Rather, strategy, much of strategy, is adapting to changing circumstances. And I think what Al-Qaeda has done is they've done a good job of adapting to changing circumstances and they've explained how. Now, I, I agree that, that in some of this, you know, there, there are propagandistic statements. And mm -hmm. you know, clearly, when one looks to things like you know, destroying the United States through these small attacks, they're not going to, you know, small attacks are not going to be the death of America. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, even within things that I think are meritorious arguments, there's also propaganda embedded within that. Mm -hmm. uh, these are both strategic and also propagandistic statements. But I think when you look at what they're explaining each step of the way, one can see that the strategy is a coherent strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of it, you know, sometimes they will succeed more than they uh, believe. Sometimes they will fail, and thus uh, those failures never make their way into mm -hmm. the uh, overarching you know, strategic calculus that they that they hail. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, for for me, what I ended up doing is a not assuming that you know, Al Qaeda had it all mapped out in advance, and b also looking and trying to separate uh, propaganda from actual strategy uh, mm -hmm. by looking both at the realistic nature of what they claim, and second, comparing that to actual actions. I think that's a good way mm -hmm. to. Uh, see whether the strategy is actually mapping for each phase. So it's, it's interesting. Much of what, much of the evidence that you just marshaled and, and quite a bit of what you talk about in the book is generated from AQAP, which is striking because this is, you know, I think most intelligence analysts in the United States and, and certainly you know, what we see in the media suggest AQAP is, uh, represents the largest threat to the, United, to the U.S. homeland at this time. But that was not the case. 10 years ago. At the same time, there is a lot of, some might call it triumphalism, you know, it might yeah. be how you would frame it, um, talk about the elimination of Al-Qaeda or the, or the defeat of Al-Qaeda, whatever that means exactly, right. especially in the wake of the, the death of Osama bin Laden right. and in a, a variety of subsequent strikes that I think are, 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 are quite important as well. Um, how does the, the sort of uh, the relative rise of the affiliates versus the center impact this strategy in the way that you think about it? Uh, well, for one thing, I, I mean, I agree with what you said about Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula coming to the fore. And you know, ACAP is a little bit um, unique among the affiliates. It's much more of a branch than an affiliate, mm -hmm. given its historical relationship mm -hmm. with Al-Qaeda. But uh, I, what I saw I mean, prior to bin Laden's death is kind of this division in which ACAP seemed to be more focused on propagandizing for, to Westerners, carrying out smaller scale attacks that could still cause a great deal of damage, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib uh, and the uh, two um, ink cartridge bombs, both of which mm -hmm. ultimately got onto passenger planes after being put onto FedEx and UPS planes. Um, while the Pakistani uh, central leadership, among other things, was focused on carrying out larger scale strikes. Mm -hmm. uh, the October 2010 uh, plots that were designed to carry out a number of urban warfare style, Mumbai style attacks in Europe mm -hmm. uh, were examples of uh, what was intended to be larger strikes. Um, I think they moved to a, a bit of a division of labor. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it, the rise of the affiliates um, means number one that, uh, well, first of all, there's going to be the question, right, about what is the relationship between the core and the affiliates. And you know, prior to bin Laden's death, I'd been on the side of uh, bin Laden probably playing a greater uh, role in formulating al-Qaeda strategy for the affiliates mm -hmm. than uh, many people thought. And I think that you know, so far it seems that the Abbottabad documents tend to bear that out. Mm -hmm. My own view is that at least right now, the central leadership still remains very important because mm -hmm. it, can make, it can turn these affiliates from being essentially regional threats to being more strategic threats to the United States. That if you didn't have, you know, now that might become less so over time because obviously we live in a world in which there's massively improved communication technology. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily have to communicate through a core. Uh, but I still tend to think that the core is fairly important mm -hmm. in transforming things from regional actors to more global actors. Mm -hmm. 
why don't we have this conversation better, right? It, this is a massive gap that you're identifying, right? The, you, I mean, I, I, I would go one step further in some ways than you would have. And I think that we oftentimes don't uh, look at the, even the end state that Al-Qaeda would like to achieve in a realistic way. It's sort of, right. it's sort of ref reflected as this sort of specter of, of the caliphate rather than really understanding what they mean by that. Yeah. Um, but you're talking about something a little bit different, which is the, the gap of strategy. Yeah. Why haven't we had that conversation? And, and what do we do to have that conversation? Rather than just saying, you know, what policies do we take over the next decade right. as opposed to the last decade, how do we make this conversation better over the next decade? Because ultimately what, what we're dealing with here is not just, you know, what should our perfect strategy be, but how do we adapt going forward? How do we, how do we improve the way that we develop our counterterrorism policies? I, I think... You know, I talked to a number of planners in government. I mean, there's there's two parts to the question. There's yeah. how how do we, you know, all of us, including us outside of government, have this conversation better? Then there's a question, since a lot of this strategy is, of course, going to be flowing through the U.S. government, mm -hmm. how do you have this conversation better within government? Mm -hmm. So starting with the government piece of the puzzle, I talked to a number of people who were, uh, you know, active in formulating U.S. strategy uh, within government, asking them first of all. You know, do you think there's something I'm missing? You know, do you think that there's actually some good strategic document which outlines all of it? And mm -hmm. you know, the answer was, but from all of them was no. Uh, Charlie Allen, um, you know, who was working uh, to head up uh, DHS's okay. Office of Intelligence and Analysis, you know, the argument that he made is, yeah, I mean, we really should have done this, uh, but we were so busy trying to prevent uh, various threats that mm -hmm. we didn't have the time. And you know, actually, you know, all things considered, uh, DHS is, is the um, one of the branches that I think least needs to do that analysis because it really is just charged with defending against a potential threat. Not that it wouldn't be helpful, but it's one of the branches I'm more forgiving of. Um, but I think that the second thing which was uh, offered to me by Brian Michael Jenkins of the RAND Corporation is that we just didn't see terrorists as being worthy adversaries, mm -hmm. which is a little bit perverse because on the other, on the other hand, you know, we poured a lot of money into this and legitimately did go to war with a certain subset of terrorist organizations. But I, I think that there is a view that unlike you know, the Soviets in the Cold War, unlike German generals during World War II, we didn't really need to study these guys and understand what their overarching strategy is. And you know, the NMSPWOT, the National Military Strategic Plan for the War on Terror, actually you know, makes the argument that they didn't need to understand the strategy because it's a diffuse organization with no overarching goal, mm -hmm. which isn't entirely correct. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that, that their lack of strategic appreciation is a major, major oversight. Um, so within government, you know, I think that a frank acknowledgement of the errors we've made over the past decade is an important part of that. Um, outside of government, uh, you know, I mean, I th t to me, it comes down to just having a better framework for thinking about these issues. Um, you know, oftentimes a, a better framework, and also, I think, making this discussion a little bit more evidence-based. Mm -hmm. uh, one bad tendency, I think, outside of government is often you'll have people who've, you know held top security clearances, make de uh, de uh, declarative statements about what Al-Qaeda is all about without any proof, uh, with just the assumption that they should be believed because they'd been in such and such a position. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are thinkers, like one person who I respect a lot is Bruce Hoffman, whose work, I think, uh, tends to be very evidence-based and uh, very you know, well mapped out in that regard. I think it's important because now we have a huge stock of material, and much more so once this, these Abbottabad documents become declassified. Mm -hmm. and I think it's really possible to have these evidence more rooted in uh, evidence. But you know, when, when, when one is a strategist or is, is involved in strategy at every, any level, you have to have a basic appreciation of what strategy entails. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our discussions seem to have proceeded without those foundational questions of you know, what makes a strategy? How do we conceptualize a terrorist organization? And I think as, as our field becomes a bit more mature, my hope is that people will be better at doing that, and you'll get other disciplines that play more a role in guiding these discussions. Does your argument imply that we win simply by spending less? Well, one, one can't necessarily say that. It depends on what we spend less on. Okay. I, mean, I don't think that every dollar spent is a victory for Al Qaeda, nor is every <laughs> dollar saved a victory for the United States. Um, but systemically, yes. I mean, if we had spent less over the past decade, uh, we would have been much better off. I mean, I, I would phrase it this way. I would frame it this way. If you look at us a decade ago, um, you know, Al Qaeda, you know, Bin Laden clearly, and, and this is unequivocal in his own writings and speeches, mm -hmm. um, he, he even said this publicly, it was accessible to us. Um, he clearly identified the US's economy as its key strength. 
the key thing that made the US a military power. Mm -hmm. So one thing that goes into the calculation is not just what do we want to do with this adversary, but you know, what is it that the adversary wants to undermine and how do we make sure that they don't succeed in doing that? Mm -hmm. I mean, what I see is, if you look at the past decade, I see us expending a lot of our resources without thinking about you know, what will the impact on that what will the impact be long term? Mm -hmm. And it's particularly problematic when we've expended resources in a manner which isn't reflective of having a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, like often, the drone wars to me are one example of where we have often, not always, mm -hmm. but often mistaken a tactic for a strategy. Yeah, let's come back to that and I'll, I'll ask my final question and then we'll go to Q&A, which, which involves the drone fight because they, they have proved very successful at taking out the, the central leadership and and are now being used in Yemen and, and, and in other places around the world. Um, and that has led many in Washington to conclude that the fight against al-Qaeda is very successful. Where, I mean, where do you see that today? What happens if Ayman al-Zawahiri is killed? Does that impact the argument that you're making? Um, and if so, how does it? Well, Zawahiri being killed would. Yeah. Because um, what that would mean is the rate of attrition within the organization at, top, at the very top level mm -hmm. would be, you know, if you had two killed within like a, a seven-month period, I would have to reassess my argument mm -hmm. in my view. Um, I mean, so far, nothing that's happened has changed my, my view, but there are some things that can come along and change one's view. There are also unknowns that could actually alter my argument in important ways. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one thing that's largely unknown is al-Qaeda's budget. I mean, there's um, an interesting article um, that came out late last year by Shahzad, the journalist who was mm -hmm. killed by ISI. Um, and you know, what it indicates is that um, Al-Qaeda had about a $23 million budget to spend inside of Pakistan, mm -hmm. independent of its internal operations budget. We have a mm -hmm. few windows in, but there's certain things that can be far different uh, that could actually significantly change my analysis. And you know, uh, at the end of the day, I try to account for those unknowns, but there's always, you know, the Soviet Union was much structurally weaker mm -hmm. um, than analysts thought it was in the 1980s, and then it collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, that was you know, based on a misreading of certain factors. So I acknowledge that there could be certain things my analysis gets wrong. But as to the state of the network, um, you know, one thing that I've recommended quite a bit since my book has come out, one piece of writing, is, this, um, is a thesis written at uh, Fort Leavenworth School of Advanced Military Studies uh, called The uh, Form, Function, and Logic of Clandestine Cellular Networks, written by a then major named Derek Jones. Mm -hmm. And it looks at another one of these key questions that we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. And that key question is, what is the impact of losing a leader you know, in a position mm -hmm. on a network, on what he calls a clandestine cellular network? And the argument he makes is that it has almost no long-term impact. Mm -hmm. Like, that you can't just defeat an enemy like this through attrition at top levels of the organization. I think it makes a very compelling case I think that there are a few holes in it. I mean, the, one of the holes is, uh, what about an ideologue like mm -hmm. Anwar al-Aleki? I think he is actually more valuable to the organization than an analysis that just looks at possible replacements uh, mm -hmm. will factor in. But uh, the overall argument he makes is you can't just win through a war of attrition at top levels of the organization. Rather, it has to be mapped into an overall strategy. And he has some interesting strategic, um, you know, strategic recommendations but to me, that's a very important work mm -hmm. in its analysis. And you know, it, it looks specifically at um, al-Qaeda in Iraq. Also, you know, Israel's experience with uh, fighting against Hamas mm -hmm. is another good indication of where they've wiped out the leadership on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. But it's not as though Hamas has gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to me, that is one of these very important questions. We need to understand what the impact is of killing any given leader on the network. Mm -hmm. And you know, if... Uh, the impact isn't that great, then we really are mistaking a tactic for a strategy. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I lied. I'm going to ask one more question, okay. which is that does a, does a strategy that spends less, I mean, the, the argument when it, when it hits the sort of real world, people will interpret a strategy that spends less as one that accepts more risk. Um, is that true? Do we need to understand and be able to accept more risk? Um, it, you know, I, you see hints coming out from the note. You know, no politician is going to say that, right? Yeah. But you see hints from the administration when they talk about the need to have, need to, you know, improve resilience and those sorts of things that acknowledge the fact that that risk is there and that at some point there will be another attack of some kind. Um, you know, do we have to acknowledge more risk? Do we have to accept it? Or do we simply need to allocate resources better? And if so, 
Uh, I'll let the, the audience will probably ask how, but. Uh, that, I mean, that's a very good question. Yeah. It's a critical question. I mean, I think that the first thing we need to do is the easy thing, which is allocate resources better. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the question of do we have to accept more risk, um, I mean, the first thing I would want to do is to um, improve our efficiency of policing efforts. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, when you're looking at a budget with numerous threats, um, we've been operating essentially as though we have a zero risk paradigm for terrorism. And it's caused a lot of spending in this area. And I question whether you know, spending this much uh, really makes us safer overall. Um, now, we, we, you have to, I mean, the thing that I'm, most, that I'm most concerned about protecting against is the large scale attack. I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna answer. The, I'm actually gonna boot this question. I very rarely boot <laughs> questions, but just because it's 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 a difficult question to answer in the abstract. Yep. Uh, but my gut tells me uh, that the answer may be yes. Okay. Questions from the audience? Anybody? Folks are shy. Yes, sir. Well, wait for the the microphone will come around and please uh, sure. say your name and affiliation and ask. Sure. My name is Robert. My name is Robert, I'm a private citizen, and uh, in your view, where do you think that Al-Qaeda has the, the greatest uh, presence or influence at the moment? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I'd say that there are four areas that could legitimately be considered safe havens to one degree or another. Um, and those are the tribal areas of Pakistan, um, parts of Yemen, uh, northern Mali, and southern Somalia. Um, of those, the area which I see as the greatest concern at the moment for a terrorist attack would be uh, Yemen. Um, I see the greatest long-term concern as being Pakistan, uh, because I believe that's where the group is going to relocate unless Zawahiri is killed or unless he decides to go to Yemen because it's a more favorable operating environment. And I'd see Somalia, I'd see Somalia as the area where um, depending, I mean, I'm, I'm only now coming around to the view that we have a coherent strategy for Somalia. So I'm trying now to uh, map out what the impact of that strategy is going to be. I mean, it's made a lot of, it's, it's had a lot of gains over the course of the past, say, three or four months. And part of the question is, are these gains going to be sustainable gains? But I mean, looking at the history of Somalia and the fact that improving the governance of the uh, Somalia's transitional federal government is going to be very difficult, uh, I'd say Somalia is the area where they're most primed to have a lasting uh, presence. I'll keep asking questions until, okay. until the audience is ready. Um, part of the evolution of Al-Qaeda, I would argue, has been driven by the success we've had in our direct counterterrorism operations, the drones, the pressure that we've yeah. been able to apply on Pakistan. It seems to me that at least some of Al-Qaeda's strategy has fundamentally been chosen by us rather than them, in the sense that we have destroyed and taken apart their ability to to focus on these large-scale attacks. I mean, to what extent has Al-Qaeda learned or, and to become the organization and network that it is today? And to what extent is it just sort of a, a process of uh, not, co not exactly natural selection, but perhaps unnatural selection in terms of our targeting capabilities? Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd say it's a mix of both. I, I think it's, it's more a process of, of natural selection or unnatural selection, <laughs> as you put it. Um, because one thing they've had to do is to learn on the fly against you know, uh, a country coming at them with all of its might. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before that, I think they did, you know, Al-Qaeda, of course, emerged from the Afghan-Soviet War. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was something that uh, in the waning days of the Afghan-Soviet War, Osama bin Laden and um, Abdullah Azam, who was his mentor, ended up setting up in order to uh, make sure the jihad didn't just end with Afghanistan. Um, but and they did a fairly good job of setting themselves up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had his efforts in Sudan early on, then the move to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Each step of the way, there were occasional attempts against Al Qaeda. So they improved the resiliency each time and steeled themselves as much as they could mm -hmm. uh, prior to the September 11th attacks. And that being said, um, you know, the, the U.S.'s response to 9/11 almost wiped Al Qaeda out as an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a, there, there will be debate for many years about Tora Bora and what would have happened if in this decisive battle in December of 2001, the US, rather than relying upon Pakistani forces, had ended up committing US troops to try to intercept fleeing Al Qaeda leaders. Uh, but I think, there's, I think there's a decent case to be made, as your colleague Peter Bergen does, yeah. that had the US done this, that, that could have maybe not been the end of Al Qaeda, uh, 
but could it perhaps have, um, you know, the organization may have existed, but it might have eliminated the organization as a strategic threat. Um, that, what, what that shows us um, is what I said at the outset, which is that um, in determining between the two, I think that the process of, of evolution uh, through natural or unnatural selection mm -hmm. is probably the more important of the two, mm -hmm. because what they had prior to 9-11 really wasn't good enough. Yeah. They, stu they still got almost destroyed in Afghanistan. And so since then, there's been much more of a pressure on operational security, on resiliency of the network, and the like. Mm -hmm. One of the things, when, when you say we need to spend less, and I ag completely agree with you, and, I, and I, the sections of the, of the book that I really find incredibly compelling are those about our inability to sort of have reasonable discussion about these issues. Because, um, but when we, when we sort of look at the use of drones in particular and pressure on the Al-Qaeda network uh, th with kinetic means, one of the things that, that happens is we, you know, we, we look at that environment and we always sort of say, well, we're going to transition from this tactic to something else. We're going to empower our local partners to step into the gap and we will suppress people for suppress the, the threat for now and then our local partner is going to step in. And that empowering of a local partner seems to me a natural way to think about how we spend less on these yes. problems. But empowering local partners is something that we have proved very bad at, yeah. right? We have not had a lot of success doing this. Can we improve that process? How do we improve that process, especially when we're, we're talking about Pakistan, we're talking about a, a Yemen in the midst of uh, tremendous problems and even in other partner areas, uh, you know, Iraq and other places where things seem to be do going a little bit better? It, it's a very difficult question yeah. to answer, which is going to very much depend upon the particularities of what's going on at that point. But what I would say is we should have how to do that in mind mm -hmm. as we start, in, as we enter a military campaign. As I said, like, I, I turned to Somalia before briefly to say that I've come around to the idea that we actually have a strategy in Somalia. I mean, like, <laughs> in, you know, several months ago, I didn't think that we did. I've, I've actually... I've mapped it out. At some point, I'll write about it because it certainly hasn't come up in the open source uh, literature before. Um, but there, you know, drones are part of a more comprehensive strategy. That whether it can last, that's a question. But one example of a drone campaign that occurred without a strategy, in my view, yeah. is the drone campaign in Yemen in, two, in December of 2009, yeah. where uh, we didn't have the um, we didn't have the people on the ground mapped very well. Ended up killing a lot of people who shouldn't have been killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that generated resentment towards the United States, as well as some positive views towards Al Qaeda in the areas where we bombed. Um, it, you know, it was perhaps, perhaps could be considered somewhat of a tactical victory, but at a great strategic cost. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I mean I think that that um, having a strategy in mind, and the second thing is at the outset, um, mapping in terms of intelligence as much as you can, in order to understanding that civilian casualties, particularly. Uh, certain individuals, major leaders of tribes, for example, or clans in Somalia, um, that's something that can have a major impact in terms of making the U.S. look bad and uh, dr potentially driving people into the hands of the adversary. Mm -hmm. I think that, that happens at the outset. Now, how do you have uh, a local element uh, empowered? Well, w the best example of where that occurred well, is, of course, Iraq and mm -hmm. Anbar province in 2007, mm -hmm. where um, one of the major things that went right for us in uh, you know, it's kind of like we talked about how Al Qaeda's strategy has often been uh, determined by the U.S. Mm -hmm. This is a major area in which the U.S.'s success was actually determined by Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that really went right is that Al Qaeda had massively overplayed its hand mm -hmm. in Anbar, and you know, as a result, you already were having an indigenous backlash, and uh, the U.S. you know jumped on that, partnered itself with. Uh, the Awakening, but it took a while for the U.S. to come around to the Awakening. I mean, the Awakening really was, it wasn't just something that the U.S. had set up. It really was, you know, an indigenous movement against Al-Qaeda that pre-existed the U.S. even really taking note of it. Um, and similarly, you know, th I think in areas where Al-Qaeda has been strongest, that's usually where it's mo most unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's questions about Somalia because um, when, th when you're competing against anarchy, no matter how brutal you are, you might actually come across as popular because mm -hmm. you're still better than anarchic conditions. Uh, but certainly, you know, Shabab's involvement in the current famine, you, know, you have a drought in all of the Horn of Africa. Uh, the areas that are most hit by famine are those areas which are controlled by Shabab, in part because Shabab kicked uh, non-governmental organizations that were providing humanitarian aid out of these areas. There are reports, although I mean I can't substantiate this, but there are reports of, of Shabab actually moving 
uh, Somalis in refugee camps back into the famine-stricken areas. Mm -hmm. If those reports are true, then you're going to have a great deal of resentment on the ground against this organization, mm -hmm. which will make them vulnerable to their being local partners. And as I said, in, in Somalia, quite clearly, the, the US is actually trying to empower local partners. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, it's been something we've been bad at. There have been some successes. And looking at the various factors of what went right in those successes is going to be one important part of the th various things I laid out in addition to intelligence mm -hmm. strategy and then you know, conditions that can give rise to robust local partners. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, how about right, right behind you, Jennifer, and then we'll move forward. <laughs> Hi, uh, Pam Benson from CNN. You mentioned El Alaki was more valuable to the organization. Was that strictly as an English propagandist, as an operations leader? And uh, do you see anyone that could replace him as an English speaker? Uh, yeah, that, that's precisely what I mean, that he was valuable to the organization as uh, an English propagandist, that he was someone who had this unique mix of being uh, seen as theologically legitimate um, by his followers, as speaking perfect English, being uh, familiar with the Western and particularly the US cultural context, and also being charismatic. Um, I'm not gonna say that, that nobody will step in and fill in the void. I mean, there are some, um, some, there are some very charismatic quasi-jihadi spokesmen throughout the world who are kind of like what Alaki was prior to uh, becoming you know, Alaki in Yemen. You know, he was this kind of quasi on the fringe figure where he'd kind of be within the lines, kind of outside the lines. Um, I think there are other figures who can make the transition from being an on the line figure to an I've thrown in all my weight with Al Qaeda figure, uh, but it's not clear that that's going to happen. So for Alaki, I'm sure that there'll be um, other spokesmen like him, I'm not sure that you'll have another spokesman who's as good. I mean, you look at Al Qaeda's first major English language propagandist, Adam Gadan, and he's like he's an embarrassment. Uh, I mean, he's this guy who speaks like English isn't his first language, even though it is, uh, who you know, mispronounces words. Uh, he's I mean, he he wouldn't even be par he wouldn't even be charismatic in Lord of the Rings, which is clearly the universe that he's come from. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, right here. I would like to, my name is Aisha and I'm a TV reporter with Voice of America. So I would like to go back to the very basic question. What would, um, in your viewpoint, what would have been the right strategy then to counter Al-Qaeda? And then um, where does the tactic or the strategy of uh, negotiations um, with the terrorists fit in? Okay, so um, quickly, uh, before you give up the mic, uh, for the first question, what would have been the right strategy? You mean just overall, over the course of the past yes, 10 years? Yes, in your viewpoint. Okay, um, so as to the first question, what would have been a better strategy? I think that um, you know the very first thing, and this is what I point to as the keystone error, is map <laughs> al-Qaeda strategy. Like Before you go to war, understand what it is your opponent is after. And I think if you have al-Qaeda strategy mapped as well as you can at the outset, without the, well, you know, this is a diffuse organization, no unified goal, then you're going to end up making less errors along the way. Um, I think that basically take the two strategic uh, goals that I put forward from Al-Qaeda and try to, fight, try to combat both of them. One, he wants to make us spend a lot of money, and two, he wants to make the war as broad as possible. So at the very outset, you know, limit it to Afghanistan. Uh, try to eliminate Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Pakistan, if you can. Don't move on to Iraq. Don't start drawing military resources away because the war in Afghanistan would have looked very, very different had we not suddenly gone into Iraq with the drawdown of CIA, special forces, and other things that that entailed. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, keep it narrow. Second, when we set, set up the Homeland Security apparatus, look, I'm, I'm not going to uh, you know, pound my fist too heavily on all of that because um, there was a fog of war effect. And you know, legitimately within government, they were trying to um, you know, prevent another attack. Uh, but I, I think that the glee that, that was almost taken in the inefficiency of certain measures uh, was problematic. Uh, one example of this is uh, TSA lines, where uh, you know, there's a very much um, a, a boastfulness in the US government about how everyone's being treated the same in TSA. And let me be clear, um, you know, I'm not advocating racial profiling, which I think is probably the least effective 
means of profiling, but look at things like, if you look at terrorist profiles across a broad range of terrorists, one thing you don't find is like four-year-old terrorists. You also tend not to find very old suicide bombers. Um, I mean, there are, and there are various ways that you can try to limit down uh, the people who are searched. To me, one, one example I, I give a lot is Al Gore during one trip to Wisconsin being singled out uh, for secondary screening twice. And you know, regardless of what people think of Al Gore's politics, he's probably not going to blow up a plane. Um, now, that's only one example, of course, or two examples, since it's Al Gore two times. But it, when you aggregate it through the system, it ends up being an enormous inefficiency, that there's someone who's a known quantity, and you know they're not a terrorist, but you're going to search them anyway because there's a concern that you want to treat everybody the same way. And I think that that, um, that indicates the kind of inefficiency that when we're, where we were a decade ago, you know, this massively rich country that could afford inefficiency, um, you can understand why this went into effect. But the fact is when you're dealing with more constrained resources, you actually have to uh, set up your checkpoint security and other kinds of security uh, more efficiently. I mean, that's just one example. But I think setting up, you know, looking at the system and trying to make sure from the outset that you have efficiency applied to all of these areas. Um, and I'll put one more thing as kind of a, a, a prior concern, which is not just Al Qaeda's strategy, but also what are the strengths that we have uh, that make us a powerful country and a powerful opponent for Al Qaeda. Uh, and that also gets back to actually the same set of resources that I'm talking about. And one more reason that you uh, need to strength, structure homeland security in many ways, um, in so many ways, um, in a more efficient manner. I mean, the thing that I always put forward as the easiest thing to uh, make our efforts much more efficient is civil service reform. And I'm going to keep saying this, that we wouldn't be as reliant upon contractors, uh, which tend to be more expensive. Not that individual contractors are greedy, but there's a lot of overhead that goes into that. We wouldn't be so reliant if we had civil service reform where federal employees could be hired and fired uh, more like in the private sector, where it's not almost impossible to get rid of people. Now, I, I think that I, I'm not too optimistic that this is going to happen, but I keep saying it because it's, to me, one of those clear areas where if we did it, it would be tremendously good for our government. As to negotiations with terrorists, you know, it's one of those things that comes down to um, you know, who the, um, who the so-called terrorists are. I mean, there are certain, when you look at Al Qaeda, uh, and I say so-called because um, certain Taliban groups I wouldn't classify as being terrorists, but within Al Qaeda, you know, they have a pretty uh, well-mapped ideology that leaves no room for gray area. Um, I mean, they see, uh, they see those who don't subscribe to uh, their uh, interpretation of Islam as being enemies, and they've shown that both in their attacks against the West and also killing other Muslims who they perceive as being, as not being good Muslims. So I think people who are Al Qaeda core members, there's not a whole lot of room for sitting down and talking things over at all, in my view. Uh, whereas when it comes to different groups that have gotten drawn in for other reasons, there's much more room to talk. You know, when you map out Taliban groups, and like I said, this is why I use the term so-called terrorists, uh, for certain Taliban groups, some of them uh, are you know, in Afghanistan uh, doing basically what has you know, always happened in Afghan war, which is switching sides, going with the victor. You know, there are other people who have financial incentives to be part of the battle. Then there are others who are more kind of hardcore and what we term irreconcilables. I think if you have a good mapping and a good understanding of who you're talking to, it can be valuable. But I mean, talking for the sake of talking can either waste your time or uh, perhaps even be counterproductive if you're, for example, sitting down at the table with Ayman al-Zawahiri and you think you might find common ground. Why don't we come up here and then we'll go back this way. This has been a really interesting conversation. I'm Mitzi, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. And I've been around a long time. And my experience with the military was that they were so enamored, enamored with um, Technology is our force multiplier. That was the way in which everything was looked at. Uh, the need to understand other people was just not a part of the mix among the policy people as well. Yeah. Now, there are real changes going on, and what I find so fascinating is the changes that are going on in the military schools, yeah. where <laughs> I know a young woman who's going to be a junior at the Naval Academy who's going to be spending nine months in China working on her Chinese. I mean, who would have thought of that 10 years ago? Yeah. So uh, from that perspective, I think there's hope. 
but there's this other problem, which is hubris, which is, of course, we're number one. And I don't know how you deal with that. And I guess my question for you is, how would you feel if some other nation invaded the US and said, we want to tell you how to run your country? And the assumption that we feel we can do that to other countries, I find baffling. Yeah, I mean, in response to that question, I think it depends on the nation um, and you know, how good their food was. And uh, <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, the, the answer there is, is, is quite, quite obvious, with the, with the caveat that it depends upon the context. Right, I mean, like there are certain. It always, always depends on the context. We don't define the context. Right, that's absolutely correct. But there are certain areas, like for example, in Afghanistan, that's an area where I think things could have gone much better, in part because it's a country with such a history of foreign invasion that if you have an appreciation for the history and you know, define your your uh, mission in limited ways, um, it actually has a much greater chance for success than say Iraq. Where we're gonna, where it's not a country. I mean, you had the British invasion there in the 1920s, but it's a much more perilous thing to do. Likewise, the history of the Horn of Africa is a history of multiple nations um, invading each other. Uh, the expansion of Somalia, the expansion of Ethiopia, British involvement, Italian involvement. I mean, it's remarkable just how much conquest was going on there. And then state collapse in Somalia, just like you had state collapse in Afghanistan. I think those areas, like when you're going in to try to remedy a failed state. That's always when your chance of success is, is, is the best. But I mean, so I took a question where the answer was fairly obvious to put a little bit of caveats in there. But bottom line is, you know, absolutely, like A, cultural appreciation, and B, you know, invading a country should always be your absolute, absolute last resort. Um, I mean, the only time you might be perceived in a positive way is when you're going in and trying to right a failed state as opposed to topple a government and tell people how to live their lives. Let's go back here, Jennifer. Hi, my name is uh, Specialist Justin Arrington. Um, I'm a civil affairs soldier with the Army. Um, thanks for making us think a little bit harder about this. Thank you. Um, it's pretty helpful. Um, I guess my question is, we have this concept in, in uh, small unit tactics in the military where if we're going out on, on, a, on a mission and uh, you know one of, our, one of our soldiers gets hit, the first priority is not necessarily to, you know, uh, establish aid on that soldier is to change the conditions on the battlefield that led to that casualty. And uh, so the question that that evokes in, in my mind uh, for you is, um, why is the flip side tr uh, seem to be more prevalent um, of, that, of that approach where uh, in the policy realm where casualty avoidance is the objective and there's not much of a demand for a mission, you know, because we're Right. Yeah, in the military, we're a little com more comfortable with taking a blow or two, as long as there's an objective involved. There's right. a mission that we're supporting. You know, casualty avoidance isn't the objective at the end yeah. of the day. It, it has an element. So how does, how does that kind of flip side um, work in the policy realm? Well, I think it's political. Uh, I mean, just, just bluntly. And this, Brian and I were talking about a little bit in terms of, um, you know, how much risk acceptance should we have? And I, it was even a question that I booted, which I so infrequently do to questions. Uh, but uh, I think the, the reason comes down to, look, there's this assumption, and, and I'll, I'll give you a set of argument, which I, I very much dislike. Um, it's the argument that the American people could not handle another terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. This is an argument that comes up when there's a, it's come up a number of times when I point to a certain policy and say, you know, this policy is a bad policy. Um, and the response I get is, but the American people could not handle another terrorist attack. What that response is saying <laughs> is, I think that if, if there were another major terrorist attack, the American people would respond so badly that we have to have bad policy that can marginally make us safer from that other attack on the assumption that the American people would then do something even worse. This is problematic because it's a fear of your own population's overreaction that causes you to make bad policy in the first place. I think that instead we should try to make good policy and rational policy. Um, so I mean, that, that's what the answer is, I mean, the military is an environment where people know what they're getting into. And so um, there's a, you know, an expectation that you know, people accept a certain amount of risk. But there's not the same sort of expectation for the American people. And the bottom line is that we can never live in a 100% risk-free environment. I mean, that, that's just something which we don't have. There, we will never be 100% a, a safe from terrorism. That doesn't mean that we should stay up cowering. It just means that there is risk in life. And I think it's important to just make good policy 
as opposed to making policy based upon making suboptimal policy, which is dictated by certain political considerations, whether fear of American overreaction or just fear of something happening on one's watch. The only thing I'll just quickly add to that is two of my colleagues here at the New America Foundation, Peter Bergen and Andrew Leibovich and Jennifer in the back as well, um, Jennifer Rowland in the back, um, just recently did a study where they looked and, and they said since 2001, 17 Americans have been killed in the homeland from jihadi terrorism as opposed to about 72 Americans killed in hate crimes during the same period, about 15,000 Americans killed every year in murders. So just to understand the scale of, of what we've dealt with. Now there have been some near misses obviously over Detroit a couple of years ago and a, and a variety of other plots as well um, that would have dramatically raised those numbers. But it is worth keeping the, the scale in mind. Um, yeah, in the back, Jennifer. John Walcott from Bloomberg. Just a, a quick comment on the last point, which is I'm not sure whether the fear is how the American people would react or how the American media and the American political system yeah. would react. They may not be the same. But a question. Uh, you've talked a good deal about America's vulnerability to what you say is al-Qaeda's financial strategy. I'd like to ask you about the converse. How vulnerable is al-Qaeda, even with $4,200 attacks, to a financial strategy? And how effective has the uh, effort for 10 years to break that golden chain been? Well, certainly the U.S.'s sanctions regime um, has been uh, quite successful in breaking down uh, traditional sources of al-Qaeda funding. We know for a fact that al-Qaeda is hurting financially. And uh, the U.S.'s financial war against it has been um, a very big uh, part of that. Um, I think that it's not bringing it to its knees, but uh, absolutely uh, that's one area that has been uh, quite successful. I mean, that being said, um, you know, in certain countries, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, you have people who are well-known uh, al-Qaeda financiers who are kind of men about town in Riyadh and elsewhere, um, and who well, this is known. And uh, the United States doesn't do a whole lot to combat this. Uh, or, I mean, we make noise about it, but at the end of the day, especially in our relationship with Saudi Arabia, you know, it all comes down to oil. And this gives the United States less leverage than it would like in such relationships. So it's been good. Uh, it hasn't fully been decisive. And then there's, like I said, there's this other kind of layer of unknowns, which there are certain things that, that I, I don't know and I think aren't known um, even within government about uh, you know, current sources of al-Qaeda financing, what their actual overall budget is, uh, and the like, unless we're getting a whole lot more from the Abbottabad documents on this issue than I think, uh, then um, that's an issue where there's a lot of uh, what, what you know, Donald Rumsfeld called known unknowns. Sure, right here. My name is Zach. I'm a student at Catholic University, and uh, my question is more pragmatic. It, assuming that uh, we do have bad policy and overspending on this issue, uh, how do you think we go about changing that? We've acknowledged that uh, changing policy is difficult because it's an emotionally unpopular decision 10 years after September 11th. So is the solution to uh, change the minds of the American public, for example, uh, through appealing to the media to look at these numbers and uh, your arguments, or just to try to convince policymakers to go ahead and make uh, publicly unpopular decisions? Well, th that's a great question. And you know, my own personal um, way of, of trying to go about this is to convince policymakers, in, point be in part because I find that um, when any of my arguments are translated into kind of populist arguments, I tend to like them less. Um, like a, a lot, I mean, just a, a lot of my points on you know, one side or another. I mean, I t tend to be kind of an idiosyncratic thinker, so not all of my uh, thought is uh, easily categorized on the left or the right. But I, I find that when you know, they get repeated and more, uh, more popularized, I kind of dislike the way they're used. Whereas when they just go into policy, it's just it's much cleaner. Um, I mean, a lot of things that I say don't really make very good rallying cries. Like, um, we should be spending less to save more money so we'll be stronger against Al-Qaeda. Like, I mean, maybe. I mean, there, you know, 50 years ago, you had five Pashtuns uh, who were picketing the White House with uh, some fairly long, I mean, but the, I was just doing research for an Afghanistan-Pakistan historical piece. And it's very interesting. It made national news in 1961 that five Pashtuns were picketing the White House. 
Um, and so, you know, and they had a fairly complex slogan as well. Um, their slogan was uh, to uh, stop Pakistan from bombing Pashtunistan with American-made weaponry. Um, and it made national news, even though I think Americans didn't know what Pashtunistan was, and Pashtun then was spelled P-A-S-H-T-O-O-N. Um, point being, I, I draw some solace in the five Pashtuns and their uh, protest outside the White House, which, though it may not have completely changed American policy, can give hope to all of us. Yes, ma'am. I really hope that answer wasn't too flip. They, they, they told me I'd get extra points from them if I mentioned the five Pashtuns in this speech. Uh, I'm Gila from Voice of America, Afghan TV. And um, my question is that do you think U.S. policy, U.S. strategy is successful in Afghanistan but is failing in uh, fighting against Al-Qaeda? And how successful it is? So well, I, I think that in Afghanistan I wouldn't call it a success. I mean, I think that the, I think that the U.S. Um, was not wrong to go into Afghanistan. I, mean, I think that it was a, a state that had failed. Um, you had the Taliban's brutal governance, and al-Qaeda had a safe haven there. So I think that going into Afghanistan was the right thing, but a lot of the very interesting questions about Afghanistan um, are unfortunately, I think, questions that uh, are, have already passed us by. Um, you know, for one thing, um, you know, if the U.S. had not gone into Iraq, Afghanistan would have looked very different. I think there are other mistakes made with respect to Afghanistan including setting up a very centralized constitution for a country that has traditionally been very decentralized. I think the lack of a policy towards Pakistan, as Pakistan funded the insurgency in Afghanistan, was also a problem. Uh, I think that US planners really thought that Pakistan would be easier to flip than it was. Um, you know, they, Richard Armitage quite famously called up Musharraf and threatened to bomb Pakistan back to the Stone Age if it didn't comply with US demands. And, Musharraf ultimately banned a number of jihadi groups and took some other steps uh, towards uh, what the U.S. wanted. But you know, there's this whole history there, which begins with Afghan, uh, which gets into the five Pashtuns I mentioned before. It begins with uh, Afghan aggressions against Pakistan over Pashtunistan and a desire to split West Pakistan into two, um, which in the 1970s, when uh, Daoud uh, ended up executing his coup and referring immediately to the Pashtunistan dispute, you got Pakistan responding under Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto with a forward policy of supporting Islamist groups inside of Afghanistan, including Hekmat Yar. Uh, this is prior to the Afghan-Soviet War. Uh, these Islamist groups who opposed uh, the Afghan state. That was a response to Afghanistan's aggression against Pakistan. Now, I'm not saying that makes Pakistan's subsequent um, actions forgivable, but it introduces this complex mix, which has both the strategic doctrine with respect to Afghanistan itself, and also with respect to India. It has you know, a change in organizational culture as you got the Islamization policy for society under Mohammed Zia al-Haq. And then you have these personal relationships that started to form in the 70s, then in the 80s, um, with the Afghan-Soviet war between ISI officers and between the, Pakistan, uh, between the Pakistani military and uh, Islamist groups in Afghanistan. Then that was accelerated in the 1990s with the Taliban, uh, which actually proved these strategic calculations to be correct. Because the 1990s, that was the only period since the creation of Pakistan when Afghanistan had good relations with Pakistan and bad relations with India. Um, so what you have is a complex, what I've just described is actually a very complex mixture of motivations on Pakistan's part, uh, including uh, strategic calculations, organizational cultural calculations, and personal relationships that make it very difficult for that country to turn back. That's another thing which I think has gone wrong, the lack of a Pakistan policy. All of which goes to say, no, I'm not saying that we're doing great, yay, in Afghanistan, but I do think that we're at a point where our course in Afghanistan is actually pretty set. I mean, when you look at the various think tank reports coming out from various sides of the political spectrum, they all converge around the same set of ideas about what's gonna happen between now and 2014. You know, moving towards uh, more counterterrorism and advisory operations on the US's part, standing up the Afghan forces, and then eventually moving to a residual force. And you know, these reports, and the think tank reports, I think, are important not for the virtue of think tank reports, but because they show how different political factions are thinking. Um, and they're kind of converging around the same set of ideas, even though the very small differences between them seem to be very bitterly fought. Mm. We're, I'm going to take my uh, moderator's prerogative again. We, we are on sort of a glide path in Afghanistan, I agree with you, and, yeah. and at the same time we are in the process of getting out of Iraq, largely. Um, where is this going to leave us in five years? 
you know, will we, will we have reduced our spending on these issues to a sustainable level? I mean, ultimately, it seems to me that that's where we're headed. We know that this is a problem that isn't going away overnight. And we're trying to find a way and to find a strategy that, I that we can su sustain in an era of uh, economic uncertainty and increased competition from other global powers, right? I mean, a lot of us would say, you know, I, those of us that study Al Qaeda, you know, it may be bad for business on one level, but frankly, if we are focused on Al Qaeda as our greatest threat in 20 years, we're probably doing pretty good because that means it's not China, it's not yeah. Russia, it's not some sort of dramatic global warming or something. I don't know. Um, you know, are we on the right glide path? Is it, are we headed towards the right place? And if not, you know, what are the sort of major major changes that we would make? I mean, I, I still obviously have critiques about the overall um, efficiency of our homeland security system. Uh -huh. um, I've voiced some of these uh, TSA point um, and just the lack of coordination among the various agencies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as to whether we're, we're on a glide path where we're gonna get there, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an arguable position. Um, you know, it, in part, um, as, as you said at the outset, uh, my book is, is somewhat provocative in part mm -hmm. to get people to think about these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the argument that we are on a glide, glide path is at least an arguable one. People, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the budget is, right? Because we don't know the fully, you know, it's, it's hard. Like I tried to map what our budget is for intelligence, homeland security, along with like, various military things that are devoted to the war on terrorism. It's very hard uh, to fully map. People I've spoken to who've served within government um, seem to think it's not sustainable even if the wars uh, wind down. But mm -hmm. it's not as though they really know the answer either. Mm -hmm. It's at least an arguable position, and if I disagreed, it would just be an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, one other thing to think about, though, is that you, know, you look at the October 2010 plot, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons it was uncovered was because of a detainee in Afghanistan, who then, you know, the U.S. at the time did not have Yunus al Maratani's name. al Maratani was the architect of the October 2010 plot to carry out these urban warfare style attacks in Europe. Uh, they learned that person through a detainee who was picked up on the Afghan battlefield. Mm -hmm. So the question is, as we pull our military resources away from Afghanistan, um, do we lose the ability to find out about plots like this? And I'm just saying that that's one other thing that needs to be part of the equation. And that's been a point I've made quite a few times uh, around town as people think about, as you, know, you have this argument, which I strongly disagree with about Al-Qaeda being dead come up, it's that, you know, yeah, we've been able to stop dramatic attacks. Do dramatic attacks become more likely as we pull away from Afghanistan? And I think that there is a fairly good chance that the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Mohammed Ahmed. I'm calling. Uh, I'm for Voice of America, actually Afghan service, but radio. Uh, I don't want. To, I want to know that how do you see the relationship of fundamentalist groups in Afghanistan, such as Haqqani Network and Hekmatyar Hezbollahi, who acting against the current government in Afghanistan, and also they launch attack against U.S. troops or NATO troops in Afghanistan. And recently, Admiral Mullen accused the Pakistani uh, ISI intelligence, which has a relation with the Haqqani network. How do you see the serious threat and risk of these Haqqani network against uh, NATO forces in Afghanistan? Uh, I guess NATO forces in Afghanistan? I mean, from recent history, uh, it certainly seems to be um, a significant risk. I mean, the. One of the debates that you get um, is, you know, how big uh, a risk is the uh, Haqqani network overall? You have this um, report that came out from uh, Brian's old uh, stomping grounds, uh, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, which argues that, uh, in fact, the Haqqani network was a far more important part of global jihadism than most analysts um, have believed. I mean, I'm in the midst of doing uh, somewhat of a deep dive on the Haqqani network, and so I would uh, actually, that's another question I would boot a bit until I've gotten a chance to really uh, go through the thousands of pages of archival evidence that I'm trying to read through. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? I'll ask one final question and then Great. we'll do, do uh, one ceremony. last tour. Yeah, um, and w which looks you know, at some of the, the, the bureaucracies that we created. You've talked about DHS a little bit. 
But we also created NCTC, we created the DNI as a response to the 9-11 attacks and, and attempted to, uh, through those institutions, strengthen our ability uh, to do strategic intelligence, to develop uh, the right way to think about these problems. So my question A is, do we need to change those institutions? B has the, I mean, maybe, maybe that's B. A is, you know, do we look to those institutions? Have they fallen down on the job in terms of understanding Al Qaeda? Or is the problem at the political level? Is this embedded in the intelligence community in the way we do intelligence? Because one critique that we have of the intelligence community is that we spend most of our resources chasing individuals and chasing specific networks and not enough time and effort stepping back and looking at the big picture. Is that the heart of the problem? Is it that policymakers don't want to hear it? Um, and depending on your answer to that, do we need to reform these institutions that we've created? Do we need to make a change? Okay, well, I'll start with kind of, um, I mean, there's, there's kind of two paths you're looking at. There's the architectural path, mm -hmm. and then there's the analytic path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, architecturally, I'm not as concerned about there being a perf um, you know, this um, expansion of institutions like NCTC, DNI, et cetera, um, and DHS. You know, they're, they're there. I'm, I'm more concerned about the microarchitecture rather than the major architecture. Mm -hmm. What I'm concerned about is the, um, the mushrooming of you know, smaller shops mm -hmm. within these institutions that seemingly do repetitive work. And the question is, can some of that <coughs> repetitiveness um, be, be weeded out? And um, the answer is not as apparent as one would like because of some of the secrecy that pervades these institutions. Like, right. uh, as uh, the Top Secret, Secret America series in the Washington Post makes clear, sometimes even people who are running a program uh, don't have access to a part of the program that they're running, uh, which is you know, cleared at some uh, even higher level. Mm -hmm. uh, that's problematic for overall architectural design of the system. When you get to analysts, uh, I mean, one thing I do recommend in my book is analytic reform, which mm -hmm. you know, needs to be undertaken with humility. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, is, I think, apparent uh, over the past 10 years is the unintended consequences. When you come in and you try to change something, maybe you change it in a good way, maybe you get something that you don't want. But I do think, I, I can level a few criticisms at um, some of the way um, analysts are structured in certain parts of government. Um, there's not, and this is after doing a lot of interviews with people serving in an analytic capacity to get a sense of, of what they think is working, what they think isn't working. The biggest thing that uh, I came away with is um, lack of specialization. That there's very little incentive for many of them to specialize and get to learn an area quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, which goes to what you're talking about as we chase people, we chase groups, we have less of the big picture. I mean, understanding history, political context it is a very important part. Uh, at, like in Libya, we went in there without having the tribal structure mapped. That is, you know, in my view, quite an indictment of what that part of the intelligence community had been doing. That like, there are certain things we really should have known about Libya before going in. And the answer was, I don't know. Um, and you know, it's not as though those analysts are necessarily bad analysts. Mm -hmm. But something had broken down that we had so little information when we decided to enter into a war in Libya. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that encouraging specialization mm -hmm. <coughs> within the intelligence community and I think also, this is another area where we get to, so, to civil service reform type issues. Uh, I mean, you have 800,000 people, I think, performing intelligence work in these capacities. <coughs> I mean, how many of them are actively helping to defeat terrorism? I mean, that is, it, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that the answer is going to be you know, none. I'm not saying that the answer is going to be less than 100,000. But you know, what is the value of the work that's being done? I mean, that's an important question. I think that some of analytic reform needs to get down to questions of what is the value of work. And you know, I'll have people in different capacities show me what different intelligence shops are doing and complain a bit about it and say, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, this is, and you know, some of the products they show me are indeed shoddy products. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that those intelligence shops don't have any value. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that that is one of the questions that, that needs to be asked. Um, I wrote about a, um, I wrote in The Atlantic uh, last month about a, uh, an amendment that was proposed to the Homeland Security Authorization Act, which was actually based on some of my recommendations in my book. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, I think it's a good idea to try to actually um, get some of the official institutions within government that survey these things and look at quality, to look at our analytic quality to try to improve that. I do think that that is uh, an important aspect. And I think also embedded within that um, is a way to save money. 
-hmm. which is, again, the more you can build specialization and get contractors. Not, I don't want them completely out of the process. In fact, as someone who does contracting work, obviously I have a financial incentive for contractors to be a part of these things. But I think that that's another area where we're overspending because of lack of uh, indigenous expert capabilities within government. Right. Okay, uh, David, before we let you go, I'm actually going to give some of the introductory remarks that I, that I forgot to do. David is with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, PhD from Catholic University and a JD from NYU. I was so excited to hear him talk, I forgot to say those things at the beginning. Um, so David, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we really appreciate you having you. Thank you, Brent.